the Natural Selection. Hello and welcome to the Natural Selection podcast from the University of Exeter's Centre for Ecology and Conservation. I'm Philippa and today we are joined by PhD student Lewis Bartlett to talk to him about his research on modelling virus evolution in bee populations. Hi Lewis, thank you very much for joining us today. How are you? I'm well thank you, it's a real pleasure to be here. That's great. First of all, please can you introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us a bit more about your current research. So I'm Lewis, I work here at the Centre for Ecology and Conservation, principally looking at how the structure of populations, how frequently animals interact with each other, can affect the evolution of their pathogens and their diseases, and then I apply that to beekeeping and beekeeping practices to try and help reverse declines and trends in falling bee populations. Okay, great. And where did your interest in pollinators and disease stem from? Have you done the beekeeping in the past, for instance? Yeah, I have done beekeeping in the past. Um, looking back across my childhood, it strikes me as really apparent that I've always had a long-standing interest in bees and pollinators. I never really realised it at the time, but from being really young, you know, six or seven, if I dig through old boxes, I find little diaries where I was running around as a child catching bees and looking at them and identifying them. And I think, oh, good God, I was put on this <laughs> path a long time ago. Um, the interest in disease came up much later in part of my kind of professional endeavours during my undergraduate. Um, we were taught, of, taught a lot about influenza and modelling um, human diseases with very little focus, on, unfortunately, on that implication for both wildlife but also managed biological systems, you know, farmland and things like crop diseases, a huge area of research that I wasn't really exposed to until I was 2021 20, and going into the end of my degree. I never envisaged that I'd be able to marry those two joys. I'd done a lot of work during my undergraduate on bees and pollinators. Um, I worked at the University of Leeds for a while, working on their honeybee research labs, um, infecting tens of thousands of bees with fungal parasites to see how they evolved within hives. Um, And then upon graduating and exploring my research career further, after bouncing between a few different research opportunities, I was pointed in the direction of this PhD that married my kind of academic interest in diseases and my much more applied interest in bees and so I kind of gave up my own beekeeping and shipped myself over here down to sunny and beautiful Cornwall <laughs> to um, begin this endeavour. It is very sunny and beautiful here, yeah. <laughs> Are you collaborating with other organisations aside from the University of Exeter? So in my case, yes, a lot of my research is collaborative, especially for the scale at which my PhD works. Working on evolution obviously requires quite long-term experiments, particularly if we're wanting to study these things in the field. At least in the lab, we can accelerate things, but to do in situ real ecological disease work, you need long-term experiments. And typically a PhD doesn't have the opportunity to set those sort of field sites and systems up themselves. So in order to get around that, I collaborate quite extensively with Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, but also two universities across the Atlantic in the United States, um, Emory University, based just outside Atlanta, and University of Georgia, which is in Athens, about an hour or so out of Atlanta. And we have 300 to 400 experimental beehives out there. The honeybees are the state animal in Georgia, um, so there's a lot of funding and a lot of history of them doing beekeeping and apicultural research out there. And so I've been really fortunate in that my supervisor collaborates already extensively with them. There's a lot of shared grants, there's shared money. And as a consequence of that, I go out there quite frequently, two, three times a year, and do all my field work out there with the American beekeepers, attend conferences, speak at their beekeeping conventions, really get to know the habits that they have in terms of how they view their bees and treat them compared to back here in the UK. And through that collaboration, I'm able to access this much grander scale experimental apiaries where things have already been running. I can tap into to try and pick up on what virus evolution is happening, which was something that was unfortunately neglected across their research sphere before the start of this PhD. And can your research be applied to real world conservation initiatives? Um, I think it's important that all research could be, I'm a strong proponent of any publicly funded research at least having one applied aspect rather than just being purely abstract so even though a lot of my work is on abstracted theoretical disease evolution it's really important to me that I then go and apply that for instance to 
managed honeybee colonies. Um, applying that more to conservation with wild bee populations, obviously honeybees themselves are managed, they're introduced across most of the world, they're not particularly of huge concern for conservation, but a lot of other pollinators are. And typically, the way we modify our environments to benefit our livestock species or our honeybees, our crops, will have the same implications for any wild species that are in the, in the area or sometimes the opposite. But the principles are still the same. And in terms of applying the work I do on how the management of our domesticated animals influences the evolution of their diseases, particularly in situations where you get spillover of disease from our own farmed animals, our own crops, into threatened native species. For instance, there's a lot of work that's been done um, here actually in the CEC with my secondary supervisor, Lena Wilford, showing that managed honeybees and importing honeybees into the UK has caused a lot of their diseases to then spill over into our native bumblebee populations. And so what we're doing to our own managed animals then has implications for potentially rarer species that are of conservation concern. So as, while I don't myself advocate or advise you know, government bodies or policy makers on how to best protect wild pollinators, the work I do definitely has implications for that. And bringing it down to a smaller scale then, um, can you give our listeners any advice on what they can do to help bee populations in their local area? So there's loads of things people can do. If we're talking about honeybees, a lot of it is just buying local honey, um, going to farmers markets or just finding local beekeepers and asking them who buys their honey to then further sell on. Um, obviously just being mindful of the types of honey that you're buying and where it's come from you get very trendy honeys that people like to buy, like Manuka honey, for instance, but at the end of the day, it's been shipped up all the way over from New Zealand, where they have huge problems of introduced species and introduced pathogens, and honeybees aren't native to. And I think investing and buying foreign honeys like that can be quite dangerous and, quite frankly, unnecessary when we have a beautiful variety of traditional beekeeping products and practices in this country. So I definitely encourage people to kind of buy local and make sure they know where things like their honey is coming from. Um, <clears throat> encouraging people to buy locally helps prevent, especially with respect to my research, the evolution of more severe diseases because it helps limit the movement of animals and bees across the country and so reduces chances of severe diseases spreading. So always buy local, especially with bees. Um, when we're talking about wild bee populations, bumblebees in particular, um, planting flowers is always the number one action that people can take. There's a lot of moves towards meadow flowers and buying wildflower seeds. Some people like that and quite enjoy the kind of seasonal bloom that their garden undergoes when they plant these seeds, but even if that's not to your taste, just ensuring that you, you buy original breed flowers rather than ones that have been selectively bred to look different because a lot of the selectively bred flowers don't produce nectar and so the bees will visit them are tricked into coming to the flowers for absolutely no reward and that actually is imposing a really strong um, nutritional stress on most of our honeybees and bumblebees so for that reason definitely make sure that when you're decking out your gardens that you're buying native or at least mostly unmodified flower types. And the other thing to say is um, providing nest sites for bumblebees. You can buy all sorts of fancy bumblebee boxes and things like that, but there's unfortunately very little evidence that they work. Instead, what has been shown time and time again to work is just leaving small patches of your garden or your land, your fields, whatever you might have, um, unattended so that you know, rather than tilling over the soil or disturbing piles of dry leaves, that these are the environments that bumblebees search out in order to build their nests and that's the most valuable resource for them are places where they can dig down or create nests because their densities are principally controlled by how many mouse holes or small leaf piles they can get. So that would be my number one bit of advice. Leave a small corner of your garden for nests and plant good flowers. Okay, thank you. Yes, definitely. When I go shopping next time, I'll look out for the specific uh, honey that you suggested and yeah, leave a patch in my garden. So thank you. So to get an idea of what is going on with bees on campus, we are joined by the Bee Sock Secretary, Anushka Maiton. 
Hello Anushka, thank you for joining us today. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Um, so just the first question, um, what are the BSOC doing here on the Penryn campus to help bees? So at the moment we're more about spreading awareness and appreciation of bees. So for example we have guest speakers in and we show documentaries. Um, we're actually in the process of building an observatory hive which will be um, used for our beekeeping course. Um, and also to spread awareness so people can look at the bees and hopefully be inspired by them. Um, we're also hoping to use this hive for research purposes. Um, we've also got a project um, which we're planning at the moment to increase the amount of wild flowers on campus. Okay, great. And have you noticed any declines of the bee population around campus? Um, and do you have any issues of any pathogens there? We haven't actually had the chance to monitor bee populations, but we suspect that they are declining. Um, but we do actually have some wild bee colonies on campus, such as by the orchard. Um, in terms of pathogens, we suspect that we do have varroa, but this is nationwide and it's probably just in line with what bees across the UK have. Okay, um, and we heard from Lewis about what people can do to help local bee populations, such as buying local honey. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I would say that it's good to have at least two plants flowering at the same time. Um, throughout the summer and spring, as this means that uh, bees will have a constant supply of pollen. Um, also, it's good not to use pesticides in, when gardening, as this will harm the bees. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much to Lewis and Anishka for joining us, and thank you for listening. If you would like to find out more about natural selection, or if you have any questions, please visit soundcloud.com forward slash Exeter hyphen podcast. Please follow us on Twitter at UOE podcast and Facebook at facebook.com forward slash UOE natural selection. Thanks for listening.